Hey every peoples, Marcus here from Fifth Ace Comics, and welcome to Iron Sworn. Now, those of you who are into tabletop RPGs probably know about Iron Sworn. It's a neat little indie RPG that came out not too long ago. I think it's been out for a year or two by now. Uh, created by a one Sean Tomkin, and this is a rather innovative RPG in that it is possible to play completely solo. In that you don't need a GM, you don't need additional players, uh, you can play it by yourself. And that might sound a little lonely and a little counterintuitive to what tabletop RPGs are usually about, which is getting around the table with your friends, but you can still play it like that. You can get your friends together and still play Iron Sworn as though it were a more traditional style RPG. But I like to think of the solo version of Iron Sworn as something of a narrative tool. It's a way of telling a story without knowing exactly what the outcome might be, which is my preferred method of writing stories. I usually don't uh, have an ending in mind, or if I do, it's very vague and in the far in the future and I don't know how we're going to get there, which is basically what Iron Sworn is like, because you have a character and that character does have an end goal. It's known as their background vow. We'll get we'll get into this properly in a moment if you don't know. Uh, but their background vow is basically what their life goal is and what they are trying to accomplish with their life, which serves as a framework for this entire story. And what that story is is a grim, gritty fantasy adventure set in a low magic setting in the heart of the wilds known as the Ironlands. That's what uh, you, this map you see here is all about. We're using Roll20 for this, by the way. Roll20, the online tool for playing RPGs. Uh, absolutely fantastic work that they've done with the Iron Sworn character sheets and everything here. Hashtag not sponsored. But... Uh, yeah, some of you who are familiar with Iron Sworn have probably seen like Adam Coble's playthrough or Mark Holmes or a few other people who have played this. And they've done it on a stream where they interacted with people and had them help tell the story. But I won't be doing this as a stream. One, because internet in my country is terrible and streaming is not very stable and not very good quality. And two, I sort of already have an idea for what kind of game I want to play and what kind of character I want to run for this. Um, but not all of it is defined yet. So that's what this video is about. This video is about setting up the world, setting up the character, and just filling in all the gaps that I'm not quite sure about. So when you play Iron Sworn, before you get into the actual meat and potatoes of the game, actually playing your character and sending them out on an adventure and doing all your dice rolls and things like that, you have to set up the world. And setting up the world is what is known as the truths of the world. What is the framework? And this is where we are going to go through the possibilities for this world and just check it out and see how we're going to build this world. Let's bring up the, the PDF here. There we go. Uh, this is the Truths Workbook. Incidentally, all of these PDFs that I am referencing from are free online. You can get this entire game for free online from the creator's website. That's ironswornrpg.com. And you can get it. You don't have to pay anything. Obviously, if you donate stuff to him, that's fantastic. And there is an expansion for Iron Sworn that recently came out called Delve. That's, that is available to purchase online. But the core rule books are completely free to get on PDF. This will cost you nothing, except some time and imagination, because this makes you work for it. So, here we go. In the truths, first we have to determine the truth about the old world. And the old world is where the people of this land originally came from. Right now we are in the Ironlands, and we are known as the Ironlanders, but we've only lived here for a couple of generations. 
before we lived here, we lived somewhere else, the old world. And we have to define here what that old world was like and why we left. Why did we travel across the sea to this new land? So the, this workbook gives you a couple of potential options for it. So one of them is uh, the old world can no longer sustain us. We were too large in number. We felled the forests. Our crops withered in the barren ground. Basically, overpopulation and starvation led us to flee across the sea. That's one possibility. There's the sickness moved like a horrible wave across the old world, killing all in its path. So a plague swept across the land and we fled across the sea to outrun it. But the one that I think I'm going to go for, for this, world, for this one, is going to be the first option on the list here. The savage clans called the Skuld invaded the kingdoms of the old world. Our armies fell, most were killed or taken into slavery. Those who escaped set sail aboard anything that would float. After an arduous months-long voyage, the survivors made landfall upon the Iron Lands. So I like that idea that we were sort of driven out of our home by these invading skulls. And the reason that I'm saying that is because I have an idea for my character that is going to link back to the skulled invasion. And because if you have a look here, uh, under each of these options gives you a quest starter, which is some potential ideas for what quest uh, your character could go on. And while I'm not going to use this quest starter for, for the Skulled Invasion exactly, I do like what it says here. You are a descendant of the Skuld. Because of your heritage, your family has long borne the distrust of your fellow Ironlanders. So I kind of like that. I like the idea that our character or for this game is a descendant of the Skuld. Maybe their grandmother was one of the Skuld. And it, I think it just like adds a little bit of um, extra to the character just to make them stand out a bit more. Because one of the, the things about uh, being the Iron Sworn, being the main character in this game, is that they're a little bit exceptional. They kind of stand out from the populace a little more. So I think the character having Skulled Blood will probably make them stand out quite a bit. Um, so I'm going to just copy this here. And... We'll take it over to here. I've already set up a, a couple of notes here just to make it easier. And we're going to just add that to the list of truths here. So the old world. Let me just paste that there. Not going to change anything about that. I like that. The Skuld came, they drove us out, and now we are living in the Ironlands. So that's where we are. Uh, please excuse the Grammarly pop-up. It just likes to do that. Okay, so that's the truth about the old world. Up next, the truth about iron. Now, iron is very important in Iron Sworn, as the, as the title might suggest. Uh, whoops, let me bring it up here. There we go. So, the idea behind iron in the Ironlands, as a basis for the entire game, is that iron is what you swear vows on. It is what the vow is sworn upon. Hence, iron sworn, the iron vow. And when you swear upon iron, that promise is soul binding. It is one of the most sacred promises you can ever make. And if you break that vow, that is one of the ultimate shames you can bring upon yourself. So iron as a whole is very important. But what is the nature of iron in the setting here? So the options are the imposing hills and mountains of the Ironlands are rich in iron ore. Most prized of all is the star-forged black iron. Now I kind of like that. I do like the idea of star-forged iron. Who doesn't want a space sword? A black iron space sword. Um, but there's also the weather is bleak. Rain and wind sweep in from the ocean. The winters are long and bitter. One of the first settlers complained, only those made of iron dare live in this foul place. And thus our land was named. I kind of like that. I kind of like that a bit more. That's got a very poetic 
evocative feel to it. And it also doesn't, um, it doesn't put iron into the forefront so much. It keeps it in the background while still remaining significant. Because if iron is so common, then I think that kind of detracts from the vows a little bit. So if you have iron, it's, it's something to be incredibly valued. I don't want it to I don't want iron to be too commonplace and if it does if it if it is commonplace in some areas those areas are very special because the third one here it says inscrutable metal pillars are found throughout the land they are iron gray and smooth as river stone no one knows their purpose some say they're as old as the world some such as the iron priests worship them and swear vows upon them most make the warding sign and hurry along their way when they happen across one. The pillars do not tarnish and even the sharpest blade cannot mark them. Now, I think that's a little bit too weird. And especially because I've seen a lot of people who have done streams on this have taken that truth. And so I don't want to, I don't want to keep it um, in too much the same vein as other people's. I know some people have done twists on it, but I'm, I'm liking the... Uh, the poetic version um, that the people themselves are iron because the land is so tough. So I'm going to use that one. I'm going to use that one. But that's not to say that um, uh, the Starforged Black Iron can't possibly turn up at some point uh, because that would be pretty awesome. I'm going to put that in there. Please excuse my windows hopping around. This is a little, this is a little trickier for me. Okay, that's the truth about iron. Why we value iron so much? Because we are made of iron, and swearing on a piece of iron is like swearing on a piece of our own souls. Okay, so that's iron. And next, we scroll down, is legacies. We are the first humans to walk these lands. Maybe. Maybe we are. Maybe there haven't been other people before us. I mean, the other options are, other humans sailed here before, from the old world untold years ago, but all that is left of them is a savage, feral people we call the Broken. Is their fate to become our own? I sort of like that too. Having some kind of wild, primal humans out there in, in the wilds, that's, that's pretty neat. Also would make some interesting interactions, uh, particularly with what I've got in mind for the character. Um, they're definitely going to be a sort of far-traveled person, and if they're running into the broken, that could make for some interesting interactions. Um, but there's also, before the Ironlanders, before even the Firstborn, other people lived here. Their ancient ruins are found throughout the Ironlands. Now, the Firstborn in this setting are... The mythical people they are the elves they're the giants the trolls the varu which are sort of like werewolves almost um so i think we can have a bit of a combination of the two here because i like the idea of the broken but what if the broken were the people that came before the firstborn and they're the same people but something happened to them that they left behind their ancient ruins, and now they are the broken. I kind of like that. We don't know what happened to them. We don't know why they became the broken. But I think we're going to use a blend of those to define our legacy. So let's put it there. Legacies. We put that there. And we say, the broken are descended from the ancients, a people that sailed here before the firstborn became prominent. So that's who the broken are. They are the ancients. And we'll include that too there. Save there. Their ancient ruins are found throughout the Ironlands. So that gives us a bit of 
um, a bit of leeway to do all kinds of fancy stuff. So not everything out there is elven. Some of it is human, but it it's no longer occupied by humans because they have descended into this broken state. Okay, I like that. After the legacies comes communities. How do we live? What What's our living situation here? So the options are, we are few in number in this accursed land. Most rarely have contact with anyone outside their own small steading or village, and strangers are viewed with deep suspicion. Not bad, but makes it a little isolationist. I like to think that uh, we would encounter more people than that. I like having a bit of a more of a fuller setting. I don't want this. I don't want people to be too disparate here. But uh, so I kind of like the second option. We live in communities called circles. These are settlements ranging in size from a steading within a few with a few families to a village of several hundred. Some circles belong to nomadic folk. Some powerful circles might include a cluster of settlements. We trade and sometimes feud with the other circles. So I also like that there's an opportunity for conflict. The third option is that there are um, villages within the havens connected by well-trod roads. Trade caravans travel between settlements in the havens. I think that's a little too established. The Ironlands are meant to be harsh. If there are any major fortified settlements here, those are probably ruins that have been taken over by other people. Or it's like one really major settlement and everything else kind of spreads out from that. So I'm going to go with the circles idea. Maybe there is a big circle out there that has um, an, a big fortification in the middle of it, but for now we're, we're sticking with the circles. That way we have some small communities, but nothing too elaborate. So that's going to be our communities. Here we go. Okay. So, after the communities comes the leaders. Who leads these circles? Here we see leadership is as varied as the people. Some communities are governed by the head of a powerful family, or a council of elders, or the priests, or duels decide who rules the, the circle. Uh, we also have each of our communities has its own leader called an overseer. Um, every seventh spring, the people affirm their current overseer or choose a new one. Some overseers wear the iron circlet reluctantly, while others thirst for power and gain it through schemes or threats. And finally, there are numerous clan chiefs rule over petty domains. Most are intent on becoming the one true king. Their squabbles will be our undoing. Now, I think this is another situation where we're going to blend all of the existing potential things here. Because there are elements from each that I like. I like the idea that leadership is varied. I don't want it to be as simple as, okay, there is an overseer or a chief in this settlement, and there's one in that settlement, and there's one in that. I, th I like to think that there's some variety there. It makes for some... It makes for some better stories, but I do like um, I do like the idea of them wearing an iron circlet as a symbol of status and power, and I do like the idea of there's some of there being some clan chiefs that want to become the one true king. I like the idea of there being a one true king, because who's to say that one true king can't be our character? Mm -hmm. You'll see where I'm going with this. Uh, so we're gonna say. Leadership is as varied as the people. We're going, to, we're going to accept that as our truth, as our main truth. Um, and that will sort of be the overarching, the overarching truth here, but there will be elements from the others that sort of leak in a little bit. Even if we, even if we don't put them directly in here, there, there's going to be some influence from the others in there. So got leaders they are varied there we go let's make this a bit bigger shall we there we go okay so now that the leaders have been decided 
we're going on to defense here in the iron lands supplies are too precious and the lands too sparsely populated to support organized fighting forces when a community is threatened the people stand together to protect their own maybe but i think with the the circle communities there probably is something that can protect them and that's where the next one comes in and i kind of like this one the best the wardens are our soldiers guards and militia they serve their communities by standing sentry patrolling surrounding lands and organizing defenses in times of crisis most have strong ties to their community others called free wardens are wandering mercenaries who hire on to serve a community or protect caravans and that is going to be the premise for our character our character is going to be an iron warden that's what they're called in my in my thing the iron warden but particularly a free warden they're going to start as a regular warden but then they're going to become a free warden this last one our war bands are rallied to strike at our enemies or defending our or defend our holdings i think some of the leaders some of the clan chiefs that rule over some of the circles do want to form war bands but there's not enough of them just yet organizing a fighting force like that takes a lot of work so maybe that's an eventual goal for some of them but for now it's just going to be the wardens and our character is going to be one of them so we'll put that in there or defense and then after defense we move on to mysticism so what is the the magic like in this realm some still find comfort in the old ways they call on mystics to divine the fortunes of the newborn or ask them to perform rituals and to invoke a bountiful harvest however most folk believe true magic if it ever existed is lost to us now or magic is rare and dangerous but a few who wield the power are truly gifted or magic courses through this land as the rivers flow through the hills so higher magic lower magic i kind of prefer a low magic setting but i don't want to rule out the possibility that there are those who can wield proper magic um so again i think we're going to combine two here we're going to find comfort in the old ways like so but I would think that I would think that there are still those who are truly powerful they're not very common you'd be hard-pressed to find a, a true sorcerer of some kind but they exist out there somewhere so we're going to combine the two just so that we have a chance to see some high magic and low magic because the magic system in iron sworn is uh is very low it is very low magic centric it's more sympathetic magic than any actual kind of really powerful stuff so i we're going to keep to that for the most part but there are going to be some of those people who can just like snap their fingers and um something cool happens okay so next religion a few islanders still make signs or mumble prayers out of habit or tradition but most believe the gods long ago abandoned us the people honor old gods and new in this harsh land a prayer is a simple but powerful comfort or our gods are many and they make themselves known through manifestations and miracles now i've never really been one for religion in my games not out of any hatred of religion or anything but uh especially in a setting like this i think it complicates it a little bit too much i think if there are gods they're probably not listening or they haven't been around for a while uh so i think we're just gonna stick with um people believing the gods have abandoned us there are probably still some people out there who worship things actually let's let's change that a little bit let's just leave off that bit like most people believe the gods long ago abandoned us let's just leave that out and we'll take the beginning part of this 
So religion. Let's get it in here. So we'll take that first part and we'll tack on the second part here. In this harsh land, prayer is a simple but powerful comfort. So there are still priests out there, but whether or not they, they venerate the gods so much anymore, uh, maybe it's just to keep just to keep people's spirits up. Who knows if they still believe in the gods themselves? But I think that that'll do. Okay, and next, the firstborn. These are, like I said, the elves, the giants, the trolls. Uh, the firstborn have passed into legend. Some say the remnants of the old tribe still dwell deep in the forest or high mountains. Most believe they were never anything more than a myth. Uh-uh, we know they're out there. The firstborn live in isolation and are fiercely protective of their own lands. I think that's bitter. I think that's bitter. I like to think, we know they're out there. They don't like to tangle with us, but we know they're out there. Um, there's also the firstborn hold sway in the Irelands. The elves of the deep forests and the giants of the hills tolerate us and even trade with us for now. I don't, I don't think that's the case. I think they're out there somewhere. We're scared of them. They don't like us, uh, so we just try to avoid each other as best we can. So that's going to be the truth about the firstborn. We, we may come across them eventually, but we're not going to worry about that for now. Because we're nice and safe and cozy at home. So next up is beasts. The beasts of old are nothing but legend. A few who travel into the deep forests and high mountains return with wild tales of monstrous creatures that were obviously delusional. No such things exist. Nah, that's boring. The beasts are the big, nasty creatures. Stuff like chimeras and, and wyverns and stuff like that. I want those in my game. So monstrous beasts stalk the wild areas of the Ironlands? That's a bit better, I think. Or beasts of all sort roam the Iron Lands. They dwell primarily in the reaches, but range into the settled lands to hunt. So, do we want the beasts to be a constant threat to our society? Or are they just out there somewhere to hunt them? I think with everything else that the people are going to be dealing with, having beasts constantly attack their settlements, probably not going to be too fun but that's why it's fun the challenge and the danger makes it worth all the more so i'd say we're going to take that beasts of all sorts they prey on cattle but attacks on travelers caravans or even settlements are not uncommon so it's dangerous out there it is dangerous. Basically, humans, our version of the humans, not the ancients or the broken, but our versions of the humans, are having a tough time. There's a lot of stuff to fight out there. We're hard pressed in this, in these iron lands. And next are the horrors. These are the undead, the ghosts, the zombies. The things that stalk the night. Nothing but stories to frighten children? <laughs> oh, no, no. They're real. We are weary you know, of dark forests and deep waterways, so monsters lurk in those places. In the depths of the long night, when all is wreathed in darkness, only fools venture beyond their homes. You can tell I like that a lot. Uh, there's also, the dead do not rest in the Ironlands. At night we light torches, scatter salt, and post sentries at the gate. It is not enough. They are coming. Now that's pretty creepy. That is pretty creepy, but I don't want this whole thing to be um, like, a, like a zombie apocalypse kind of thing. Yes, there are going to be undead and horrific things out there, but I don't. There's already enough constant threat going on without it being full on zombie apocalypse. Maybe in some circles, in certain areas, 
it can get that dangerous. But for the most part, they're just going to be this kind of ever-present threat out in the night that prevents people from leaving their homes when it's dark. I think that will that'll do for, for the horrors. Okay, so these are the truths of our world. This is what the Ironlands are like. So, quick recap. Let's scroll up here. Quick recap. We were driven out of the old world by the Skuld invaders. And we set sail to the Ironlands to escape them. Excuse me, Grammarly. Uh, they're called the Ironlands because you've got to be tough to live here. If we ourselves are made of iron, and that is why these are known as the Ironlands. In terms of legacies, there were other humans here many, many years ago, before the Firstborn rose to prominence. Maybe it was the Firstborn that threw down these old humans and made them into the Broken. We may never know, but we could find out. Our communities are called circles. Everyone gathers in these circles for safety against the horrific things that are out there in the wilds. The leaders are varied. The circles are led by various people. Um, they could be priests. They could be families that have a, a strong bloodline. They could be settled in duels. Uh, we're defended by the Iron Wardens. They patrol the land as free wardens or as sentries at the, at the circle communities. Mysticism. Not very prominent, but there are some sorcerers out there. But most is like sympathetic magic, and a lot of people don't always believe in it. Similarly with religion, not a lot of people follow the old gods, but they're still there, we hope. Maybe they're listening. Uh, the firstborn live in isolation. We don't go where the firstborn live. We don't, we don't mess with them. We want to stay out of the way. And they don't like us either. Uh, there are all kinds of beasts that attack our settlements and our caravans and travelers and eat our cattle. It's scary. It's scary out there. And it's even scarier when the horrors are involved. You don't go out at night. It's dangerous. There are dark things out there. Okay, so, like I say, I think that is going to be the truths.